Welcome to the lab, everyone. I'm Jonathan Benyon with the Institute of Human Anatomy, and today we're going to talk about why breasts are so important. Now, we all may have some different reasons as to why we find breasts important, but here at the Institute of Human Anatomy, we're going to talk about why breasts are important from a biological and reproductive standpoint. The science of breasts, if you will. And of course, give props to all the moms out there that have utilized these anatomical structures to plump up babies, deliver them antibodies, and all sorts of cool things that are found in breast milk. So on top of talking about the anatomy of breasts, we'll also talk about the physiology of milk production and breastfeeding, as well as the ingredients of breast milk. And yes, we will also talk a little bit about the aesthetics of breasts, as there definitely is some interesting anatomy that people are curious about when it comes to procedures like breast augmentations. So let's get into this. So let's start our story about the breasts by taking a look at a sagittal pelvis. This is a cut through the midline of a female pelvis. So this would be a cut here and looking into the right side. And here we have the vaginal canal, the right half of the uterus, and even an ovary right here. Now you might wonder, what do these pelvic structures have to do with the breasts? Well, during puberty, estrogen released from the ovaries increases dramatically. Estrogen has many incredible functions, including promoting the development of female secondary sex characteristics. And one of those secondary sex characteristics is the development of breast tissue. The breasts are hemispheric projections that can be quite variable in size and are made up of mammary glands, connective tissue, and adipose tissue, which is just fatty tissue. And the increase in estrogen during puberty stimulates the growth of the mammary glands as well as promotes increased deposition of fat and all this increases the overall size and mass of the breast during puberty. The breasts are on top of or superficial to this muscle called the pectoralis major, and even cover a portion of this muscle on the side called the serratus anterior. And we'll talk a little bit more about this relationship with the pectoralis major specifically when we mention some information about the different types of breast augmentations in just a minute. But the breasts attach to these muscles with a layer of fascia and are also supported by connective tissue strands that run from the fascia to the skin, called suspensory ligaments of the breasts, also known as Cooper's ligaments. And what's interesting is that these ligaments do become looser with age, which contributes to the sagging of the breasts as the female gets older. And they can also become looser with excessive strain that could occur with long-term jogging or other high-impact activities. And this is why wearing a sports bra can help to maintain the integrity of these ligaments. And as I already mentioned, there is a mammary gland within each breast, which is actually a modified sweat gland that produces milk. Each mammary gland is made up of about 15 to 20 lobes, which you can see one of those circled in this picture. These lobes are separated by variable amounts of adipose tissue, and this variable amount of adipose tissue is one of the things that contributes to the variability in overall breast size. Each lobe within a mammary gland is made up of even more compartments called lobules. And if we were to zoom into one of these lobules, we would see that the lobules are made up of these grape-like structures called alveoli. And these alveoli are lined with the milk secreting epithelial cells. And so just to kind of step back here, each breast has a mammary gland, each mammary gland is broken up into 15 to 20 lobes, and each lobe is made up of multiple lobules, and each lobule is made up of these multiple alveoli which actually contain the milk secreting cells. So that explains all the hardware or structures necessary to produce and secrete milk. But obviously the breasts aren't producing milk all the time. That is normally reserved for breastfeeding. During pregnancy, there's this wonderful gland located in the center of your brain that you can see here called the pituitary gland. And just to orient you, this is a sagittal cut through the head, so cut like so. And if you were to go straight back from the bridge of your nose, you'd run into this pituitary gland. And specifically, the anterior portion of the pituitary gland will release a hormone called prolactin. And as that name implies, prolactin will stimulate lactation. The prolactin levels will steadily rise from about the fifth week of pregnancy until birth by which time the prolactin levels have risen by about 10 to 20 times that of the normal prolactin level seen in a non-pregnant female. At the same time during pregnancy, the placenta is secreting large amounts of estrogen and progesterone, which causes even further development of the breasts by causing the milk ducts to grow and branch, as well as causes even more fat to be deposited within the breasts. And anyone who's been pregnant before definitely notices these changes as an increase in breast size. What is very interesting about the estrogen and progesterone is that even though these hormones further promote the growth and development of the breast during pregnancy, they actually inhibit milk secretion, in a way blocking some of the effects of prolactin. 
And because of this inhibitory effect, for most pregnant females, zero to no more than a few milliliters of fluid are typically released from the breast per day, until after the baby is born. Because once the baby is born, the placenta is also birthed, and therefore is no longer inside of mom, secreting that extra estrogen and progesterone that was inhibiting the release of milk. So now, all that built up prolactin can take effect, allowing the baby to have their own personal set of lactation stations. A few days prior to and a few days after birth, the fluid secreted from the breast is called colostrum, which contains similar concentrations of proteins and lactose as the milk, but almost has no fat. However, it does contain antibodies, white blood cells, vitamins, minerals, and growth factors, which are important for supporting the newborn's health and protecting the newborn from infection. Over the next week, the breast will start to produce large quantities of the typical breast milk instead of the colostrum. And we'll get a little bit more into the contents of breast milk in just a second, but let's quickly talk about milk ejection, or what is often referred to as letdown. And this is pretty cool how this works. Milk is continuously being secreted within the alveoli of the mammary glands that we learned about earlier. But the milk does not flow easily from the alveoli and into the ductal systems of the breast. So when a baby first starts to suckle, the baby receives virtually no milk for the first 30 seconds or so. But then sensory input from mother's nipples are transmitted through nerves to the spinal cord, and those signals will move up the spinal cord and make it to this structure here called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus will tell the posterior pituitary gland to release a hormone called oxytocin and tell the anterior pituitary to release more prolactin. So now both of these hormones will be circulating in the bloodstream. But again, it takes about 30 to 60 seconds for these hormones to make it to the breast tissues. Prolactin will continue to promote the production of milk within the alveoli, but when the oxytocin makes it to the breast, it will cause these cells that surround the outer walls of the alveoli called myoepithelial cells to contract. And this contraction causes the milk to move from the alveoli and into the ducts. So the milk can now be expressed and available to the baby. And this is referred to as milk ejection or letdown. Now, some other things that are interesting to note is that suckling on one breast does not just affect that one breast. It will also have the same effect on the opposite breast. So milk will be available in both if suckling starts on one side versus the other. And coming back to this hypothalamus that we mentioned earlier, one of the functions of the hypothalamus is to regulate certain emotions. And so this explains why fondling of the baby by mother or hearing the baby cry can result in an emotional signal being processed by the hypothalamus, which can also result in the same process of milk letdown to occur. So what is the composition of breast milk? Well, human milk is about 88.5% water, 3.3% fat, 6.8% lactose, which is the main carbohydrate in milk, 0.9% casein, the main protein, 0.4% of lactalbumin and other proteins, and 0.2% of ash, which is the minerals such as calcium. And it is interesting to compare this to the composition of cow's milk. And looking at this chart, there are components that are pretty close, but there are also some significant differences, such as human milk has about 50% more lactose than cow's milk but the protein content in cow's milk is more than two times greater. Also of importance is the immune support that breast milk can provide, as there are antibodies found in the milk, which would be part of that other proteins category that we saw in the chart, because antibodies are actually proteins. There are also several types of white blood cells that are in the milk, such as neutrophils and macrophages, some of which are especially lethal to certain types of bacteria. Now we should also just thank mom from a calorie standpoint, because mom can burn anywhere from 600 to 750 calories a day just producing milk. This can be higher depending on how much milk is produced, which can be up to 1.5 liters a day, sometimes even more, especially in the case of twins. So now that we've talked about the functionality of the breast tissue, many people that come into our lab are often curious about the anatomy that influences the aesthetics or the look of the breasts, specifically regarding the cosmetic surgical procedure of breast augmentation. Now the natural shape and size of the breast is mostly influenced by the size of the mammary glands and the amount of adipose tissue within the breast. And again, that varies from person to person, but other things can also influence the look of the breast like strain on those suspensory ligaments. Obviously age has an influence and even the changes that can occur with pregnancy can change the shape and size of the breast. And many of these changes can remain even after pregnancy and breastfeeding is completed. And the main thing we'll address with a breast augmentation 
is the location of the implant. There are two primary placements that you most often hear about, over the muscle versus under the muscle. And the muscle that we're referring to is the muscle we talked about earlier, the pectoralis major that you can again see that I'm tracing with the probe here. Now, over the muscle is actually called subglandular placement because the implant is placed below or deep to the natural breast tissue, but superficial to the pec major muscle. With under the muscle or submuscular placement, the implant is placed deep to the pec major, well, at least mostly deep, but I'll get into that in just a second. Now, whether a plastic surgeon and the patient decide to put the implant over the muscle versus below the muscle or under the muscle depends on a variety of factors. One of those factors being how much natural breast tissue the patient already has. Because if the patient has a small amount of natural breast tissue, putting the implant above the muscle is usually not a good option because this will likely show too much of the implant and you can get rippling. So this person could be a better candidate for submuscular placement, where an incision would be made along the inferior margin of the pectoralis major in order to create a pocket for the implant. And this tends to hide the majority of the upper portion of the implant and give a little bit more of a natural looking appearance. However, a con to submuscular placement is that recovery from the surgery can be a little bit more painful and you can get some small movements and rippling on the underside of the implant due to contractions of the pectoralis major. Whereas you wouldn't get as much of this movement during muscular contractions with subglandular placement. So there are definitely pros and cons to both and why someone would obviously want to have a consultation with a plastic surgeon prior to making any definitive decisions. One of the reasons I love the anatomy lab so much is that you do a lot of your learning by doing. It's interactive, it's hands-on, it's active learning. And that's why I wanna introduce you to another way to learn by doing. And that's through saying thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an amazing interactive online learning platform with thousands of lessons in math, science, data analysis, programming, and even AI. And since I've been teaching anatomy for the past 18 years, I would often tell my students to try to minimize the blind memorization. Ask yourself and think about why was this anatomical structure given this name? There was a logical reason for it. And this is also what I love about Brilliant. Brilliant helps you to build critical thinking skills through problem solving, and again, not just through blind memorization. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you're also becoming a better thinker. And currently, one of my favorite Brilliant lessons that's helping me to become a better thinker is exploring data visually, which helps you to brush up your skills on analyzing and interpreting data from charts and graphs, which is quite helpful when you're analyzing charts and graphs on, say, like the hormones we learned about today. So if you want to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free, for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash IHA or click on the link in the description below. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks for watching and supporting the channel, everyone. Please give us some feedback on what you thought about the video. If you want to learn more about hormones such as estrogen, we'll link that here. And of course, we'll see you soon.